when I get a call from Tom or I call him, I always start with where are you? I, what time zone are you in? What, what, what state are you in? He literally goes to places where angels fear to tread. Uh, downtown Portland, downtown Seattle, downtown Bakersfield. He just is, I've seen him participate in his ministry and it, it's amazing, people are drawn to him. It's that object lesson, you can't not look at it. When you see a guy walking down the street with a cross, you're gonna look at it. Jesus said that we all have a cross to carry. He does it literally as well as spiritually. I'm very, very comfortable on the streets. The Bible says whosoever. And whosoever is everybody. Everybody needs Jesus because we're all in the same category. We're, we're either unsaved or we're saved. Unsaved sinner or saved sinner. I was born in Vider, Texas, but I was raised in, in uh, Texas City. That's the name of the city, Texas City. And that was nine miles from Galveston Island, which is where I spent all my summers surfing, 38 miles uh, south of, of the big city, Houston. Tom grew up in a family with nine children. His father worked hard, but the family was poor. He was full-blooded Mexican, so prejudice was pretty uh, big in Texas. and. Even though he never took that personally, I began to take things personally when things happened to him, whether he was fired or, or prejudiced against, and he never would lash out, but I found myself having a real rage about how they were treating you know, my dad. I began to think that that society owed me instead of me owing them. So at, at the age of, uh, in ninth grade, uh, even before then, uh, that's when I began to, to break the law. I was stealing, I was burglarizing, I was what they call rolling drunks, uh, you know, putting knives to drunks and taking their money from them. And so I did that because I wanted to make money. I wanted to have money. And, and funny, the reason I wanted to make this money was to help mom and dad out so that they wouldn't have to have the burden of trying to take care of me. Still that rage was in me and, and eventually you know, it got to me to a point where I began to think about doing things that I wasn't supposed to do, and that led up to a bank robbery. Got away with that bank robbery, took off, ended up in Las Vegas, Nevada for a season, and, and then went to Monterey, California to go surfing and everything, you know, like I wanted to do. But when, you, when, you, when you're robbing, the FBI is after you. Uh, they have all the time in the world to uh, track you down and find you. And, and of course, I thought I was you know, not, never going to be busted. But I ran out of money, so I began to uh, rob people in their homes. He found a home he thought he could rob. Knock on the door, hey, can I use your phone? My car broke down, and some people are gullible. They, they, they let them come in. And when, when that happened, I robbed them. I tied them up just like you see in the movies and stuff like that. And I thought I tied them up enough and, and stole their stuff and I needed the car, so I stole their car. As I was driving away, I was saying, all right, I'm heading back to you know, uh, San Francisco Bay Area and then back to Las Vegas. But I looked in the rearview mirror and, and guess what I saw? Squad cars with the big old lights blaring and glaring. And as a result, uh, you know, I knew that, that my time was up. Uh, they, they surrounded me and they, you know, do, do what they do good and, and put the handcuffs on me. And after that, of course, that's when jail time and then prison time took place. I'd lay on my iron bunk, you know, the, the bunk at nighttime thinking about my future. What was I gonna do? Was this really the end of it? I mean, I saw no future because, you know, being a bank robber, being an armed robber, I mean, that's something that people don't laugh at. And I really felt that I was at my wit's end. I really felt that I really had nothing to do except to do my number, do my time, get out, and then what? Well, I'd probably have to continue stealing and robbing, and, you know, and, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a free person. Psychologists in prison labeled Tom and other inmates atavists, or genetic throwbacks, meaning they had an extra X chromosome that makes them prone to violence. I couldn't buy that. I didn't think that I was just an atavist, you know, a subhuman. I, I had feelings and I uh, cared about people. I cared about certain inmates in prison. And, and yet I, I still didn't see if there was a future. The group of Christian athletes associated with the Bill Glass Crusaders, they came into the joint 
And about 400 of us decided that we would attend that event in the gymnasium, and we listened to what they had to say. Here were uh, Christian athletes who said they were the best in their field, football, basketball, uh, weightlifting, whatever it might be. At the end of the crusade, they gave the altar call, and of course, like all inmates, you put on this front, and I told my buddy next to me, his, his name Al, my best friend in prison, I said, well, let's get out of here. And so we both started walking down the bleachers and got toward the bottom. And then all of a sudden, though, something turned me in the direction of where that altar call was. And it was like, it was like a force. It was like something that just beckoned me, you know, and it wasn't uh, intrusive, it wasn't harsh. It was something, just a, a gentle nudging and yet powerful. And all of a sudden I found myself walking down to the altar. Didn't know what that was, didn't know what to expect, but I went down to the altar, Al followed me, and then we just, you know, stayed there as they began to talk about it. And what happened is I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior into my life, February 9th, 1973. I felt the difference immediately. And something happened to me. I, it, it's like I got hope again. I, it's like a, a brand new lease on life. It's like I was gonna get a second chance, an opportunity. Tom got out of prison in 1975 and got a job quickly. He went to church with one of the prison guards he became friends with. I met Tom in church. Um, he came to church with the prison guard that he met in prison and his wife, and his wife and I were in choir together. So he would sit with them. And then uh, one day I noticed him, so I went and sat nearby. And that was how we met. I went to church, and the church we went to, First Assembly of God at Bakersfield, California, I met a young girl in the choir named Jeanette. And immediately we liked each other. She didn't know anything about me, and of course she was an inquirer, so I figured she was a, uh, you know, a Christian all the way. But for some reason we were attracted to each other. We started talking, and then we started dating. I shared with her what I was and where I came from, and that didn't, that didn't phase her. She decided, yeah, Christ Jesus really did make a change in your life. So we fell in love, and we just decided that, you know what, we need to get married because that was the right thing to do. And on February 14th, 1976, Jeanette and I decided to get married. After Tom got released from prison in 1975, he went on to work with various faith-based groups, including working with teenagers on anti-drug campaigns. In 2006, he started walking across in Bakersfield, which he continues to today. When Tom was in charge of a group called Teen Scene in Bakersfield, a man came to their recreation center with a big wooden cross. The kids got really got excited about seeing the cross, and he shared a little bit about why he was doing that. I watched that, but I wasn't interested in, in walking across at that time because I was uh, busy with these kids, not only in the schools, but also at our center. I remembered that. In 2006, it's as if God said, now I want you, you've done what I wanted you to do here with these kids, now I want you to take Bill across and take that cross all across California. He gave me the dimensions, 10 feet by five feet, of course a four by four wood, and put a wheel on it and it ended up 60 pounds. This is a 60 pound cross. You get used to it. So I went downtown Bakersfield with this cross and I said, well, okay, let's see what happens, Lord. And so I started going to the, the courthouse, to the, to the uh, council members' chambers, went to the police department, hoisted this cross upright and began to pray loud because I prayed loud and long. I began to pray loud and long that God would bless these elected officials to do what is right in his sight for the sake of the people living in our city. I walked across, but the most important part is my prayer talk to the Lord for the people that I see, wh whoever it might be. Pushing this cross up, praying on behalf of the men, the women, the children, the families affected by the criminal justice system because of crimes that they're being charged with, that they've actually committed. And let them see this cross, as your plus sign, nothing negative about the cross, all things positive. One captive, plus the cross of Jesus Christ, set free. We, we pray outright, we pray uh, long and loud. I pray audibly because I want people to understand I'm praying for them. I want them to know what I'm praying, that I'm not asking God to condemn them or uh, rain down fire and brimstone upon them, but to 
share forth and send forth his spirit of love so that people will understand how much God actually loves us. As each year passed by, God began to put on my heart to go to different cities in California. So I began to go to Southern California cities. Hollywood, California was perhaps my third or fourth destination. Had a great, great, great experience of people responding to the message of the cross, which is about Jesus Christ, of course, in Hollywood, California. And I said, wow, this is great. Other cities will do this too. So in the end, so far, 160 California cities we've been able to travel to, hoist this cross up, pray at the city halls, pray at the government building, pray at police stations, asking God to start great revival in the midst of all the people living in these cities. Surround this city, your grace and mercy. Everybody's the same. You think of people being different in different states, but everybody, is the same and has the same hurts or in some cases um, I'm surprised at how many people um, respect the cross and how a lot of people had to touch it had to come up how many times Tom said people said I needed to see the cross today that happened in all 50 states and that just shows just how much we're hurting in America and, and needing hope and needing, well, needing the Lord. When it came time to go to Hawaii, Tom flew to Honolulu only with the wheel for the cross. When he got there, a leader with YWAM, Youth with a Mission, picked him up, took him to a Home Depot, and built a cross with him. Took in his group, the YWAMers, to Honolulu, right there, uh, on Waikiki Beach, and we began to share the gospel. And they put the cross on their shoulders and they took off. And they started walking and, and lifting it up and praying and stopping. And they said, they told me this later, wow, it's very easy because people actually come up to you. You don't have to go after them. They actually come up to you and, and they wonder what's going on with the cross or they have prayer needs because they know what the cross is about. Tom took a wheel with him to the capital of Alaska, Juneau, but this time he had no local contacts. He went to a Home Depot there. I walked to the uh, commercial uh, uh, branch of Home Depot and I said, hey, I'm from Bakersfield, California, showed her my card and I come here to pray for not only uh, Juneau, but all of Alaska, but I need, I'm a crosswalker, and I need to construct a cross. Can I construct a cross in your commercial area? She looked at my car, she looked at me, and she said, sure, just like that. Two Home Depot employees heard about what Tom was doing and asked if they could help him construct the cross. I met a group of kids there later on, Campus Crusade for Christ. They call themselves CRU now, C-R-U. And, and they were on the, the, the sea walk, which is where all the cruise ships were. Cruise ships hold 10,000 people, and they were all d disembarking that day. And I'm walking across down there. So, you know, 30,000 people got to see the cross. I got to talk to a lot of people. They talk different languages because they're from other countries, but they understand the universal message of the cross. A group of young kids came up to me and they said, hey, we were told you were gonna be here today because one of the workers uh, at Home Depot was also part of their crew. And he said, look, uh, we're gonna have a group of kids down there tomorrow and maybe they'll see you. And sure enough, they did. So they all came and they got to walk the cross and hold the cross and, and it really, really touched their lives that they got to do that and how people responded to that on that, that seawalk. Tom started to take the cross to every state capital. In 2020, he had just nine left, the northeastern states. People will say, well, you won't be able to go because they're not gonna let you in motels and they're not gonna let you in the restaurants and they're not gonna let you do this or that. But God, some reason said, I want you to go. So everywhere we went, all of the last nine st states, the door was always open for us to get that motel room, to, to eat that restaurant food, but more than anything else, to hoist this cross up in these cities and the state capitals and pray for people and share with people that Jesus Christ is greater than COVID. In fact, he's greater than anything. And all but one state let us into their motels. Vermont was the only state that would not let us stay in the motel because California was on a list of 33 states that were for, forbidden to go into Vermont. So we ended up going into a, a, a city one hour away in New Hampshire. We stayed the night 
And then we actually prayed, hoisted the cross, and prayed at the state capitals. And August 21st, 2020, Maine, Augusta, Maine, made it state number 50. I'm 75 years of age. God has so far given me good health. I expect, I hope, and I want to carry this cross until at least I'm 85. I really feel that there's so much more work to do. And all you have to do is look out and see that the fields are ripe in the harvest. So I hope for another decade to walk this cross, as we say, till the wheels fall off. These next few years, again, we hope it's another decade, we want to take this cross to the major cities of America, the biggest cities of America, right into the heart of these cities, into the inner cities, into the, wherever the, the need is, is, is necessary. Push this cross up and pray for great awakening and great revival. So at least for now, Tom will keep praying and walking the cross. In the months ahead, the weeks ahead, the days ahead, decision making concerning our city, that they make righteous decisions, righteous judgments, and righteous decrees so that this city continues to experience prosperity, protection, and certainly peace from you, Lord. We pray together, I ask you to this, and I ask you for this, Lord, Christ Jesus' name, amen.